The way I see the research and teaching nexus is that as academics who endeavor in the pursuit of um, publishing and into research, um, we transition from being mere knowledge consumers to becoming knowledge producers. And in every area in academia, there are outlets um, for um, published research and papers have to undergo a rigorous peer review process. Now in management, much more so than in other areas, we have the unique opportunity uh, because we engage very deeply with practitioners to actually bring research into the classroom. And so in this segment, I'm going to talk about why it makes sense for research to be brought into the classroom. How can we bring research into the classroom and what elements of research we could possibly bring into the classroom for a more engaging uh, classroom and enriching classroom experience. Um, so I'll start first with the why. So why does it make sense to bring research into the classroom? And so for those of us who engage with research, we all know that papers, particularly in management, could take years before they see the light of the day. And that's because it might take you know, a couple of years just to understand the empirical context or the industry setting that one is working with. And by virtue of deeply delving into a particular context or with research, um, the upside is that one gets to see, or rather it's necessary, for one to be aware of the latest and greatest and cutting edge research. And what that allows us to do is that gives us the opportunity to talk about the latest research and bring that into the classroom. So what are the um, most relevant and contemporary ideas um, that, you know, that, that research is delving with and this can make its way into the classroom. Now this can complement the existing teaching material that we already give out to students but one of the great advantages of doing this is that we, lock, we don't lock ourselves into existing paradigms or frameworks because we're dealing with a very practitioner-oriented field, but we rather introduce future managers and practitioners to the latest and cutting edge um, uh, frontiers of, of research and paradigms that they need to be aware of. Another upside is that because our consumers are ultimately future practitioners and leaders, we're preparing them for a lifelong learning experience where they learn how to interpret research and they learn how to bring evidence-based research into their decision-making as future managers um, in their areas. Uh, before I move on to the why and the how, perhaps it's important to acknowledge that there are caveats in that um, not every particular kind of research may be amenable to classroom discussion, right? And that's sort of um, one thing that one has to be aware of. And also students may not have the requisite backgrounds to appreciate, for example, the empirical methods or the rigorous analytical models that go behind research papers. So this is one thing that one has to be acutely aware of because remember we all only have 90 minutes in a classroom um, in a standard lecture and, and we can't delve very, very deeply into research methods or you know, 40 page paper and condense it into um, you know, a few minutes in the classroom. Now I shift to the how and the what. So how can one possibly bring research into the classroom? And so there's a lot of scope, and I'll speak from my experience of um, doing case-based sort of writing, but also um, um, using the case-based pedagogy. There's a lot of scope for actually bringing in research into case-based discussions, because that allows for a very enriching experience and that opens up room for you know, discussion and um, also opens up the door and possibilities for critical thinking as you draw upon existing research. And I see a couple of ways in this in which this can be done. And so you could either bring your own research or research of others into the classroom. And so I'll start with the first um, possible way that I see. One is that um, research that has made its way into practitioner oriented articles such as HBR or MIT Sloan Review that um, 
revolve around a body of work which has been published in top tier journals um, and that has been condensed practically into you know a long or short article which is ultimately palatable to students. That could be one way of engaging um, with the latest and greatest research and one could give out these readings um, to students right, and draw from those articles. The other possibility is to draw directly from research articles. Now, of course, you know, going back to this caveat that I was sharing just a short moment ago, um, one cannot talk about 30, 40 page long articles. But what I have found helpful is if there is a particular conundrum or a context that I feel is important for students to understand, I would raise it as a question and I would use the research to actually inform the answer. So I would open it up for debate and then I would reflect and draw upon the research um, and, and the evidence that's out there in journals to actually support you know, and, and kind of close the case in, in a sense. And lastly, one could actually draw from one's own industry context or one's own experience in conducting research. It doesn't have to be the outcome of the research, but it could very well be simply, you know, what you've learned when you were engaging with a particular research topic. And in the last segment, I'm going to talk about, uh, give, share three examples um, that I have um, used, you know, from my own uh, teaching. The very first one was um, a case where I was introducing the concept of network effects. And of course, I gave the standard narrative, but what I also did was I drew from my own experience of helping to engage, helping to build a two-sided platform um, and I could address questions around the chicken and egg problem, which is a classic problem in you know, raising platforms, as well as the ways in which platforms can, um, can, can die, right? So eventually, um, students were able to learn from my personal insights um, of engaging with uh, a particular empirical context and the research that I was doing. So this is one way in which one could bring, uh, draw from one's own research. Another possibility and another particular case was we were talking about Tesla in a particular session. And uh, we, we finished, pretty much we were wrapping around the case. And in the end, we talked about the shift of the industry, of the auto industry, um, from combustion engines to um, you know, the electric powertrains. And um, a question came up, why is it so difficult for firms to transition to green innovation? And of course, students you know, debated a lot of ideas and it boiled down to part dependence among many other things. Um, but then we slightly shifted to you know, ways in which state intervention can help direct green innovation. And here's where I drew from the book written by uh, Felipe Aguillon on Creative Destruction, which I happened to be reading around that time. And I could actually refer um, to certain graphs that were very telling and uh, that presented the evidence of what kind of policies may work and which policies do not work very well. And lastly, uh, in a very fun case that I always enjoy teaching, I was talking about, we were discussing eHarmony, which is a dating platform. It's always a hit with students. And uh, it is a dating platform in, um, in the United States and its largest competitor is Match.com. And um, eHarmony's business model was very interesting to students because uh, subscribers to eHarmony have a much restricted choice set of uh, potential candidates they could, could date, as opposed to Match.com, which has a large database and it does, doesn't restrict um, your options in terms of who you can potentially contact for a date. Now, the conundrum here was, despite the very restricted choice set, um, eHarmony.com manages to command a much higher subscription price than Match.com. And this wasn't very clear from our debates and discussions. And around the same time as I was prepping for the case, I happened to come across um, a published article in a leading management journal, which modeled the exact situation on uh, eHarmony's case. And rather than you know, talking at length about the analytical model, I actually abstracted out from that. And I gave students the intuition that it all boiled down to the fact that um, a lesser choice set or a more restricted choice set improved the likelihood of getting matched. And that's because one wasn't 
uh, exposed to a tremendous, tremendous amount of competition, right? And I talked about the utility of being single or being alone and how depending on your utility of being, you know, the utility that you derive from being alone, one could go to either match.com or eHarmony.com. And with that, with that intuition, students were able to latch on and understand why eHarmony.com could have a sustainable competitive advantage despite the fact that it had a very restricted choice set to offer and a much smaller database compared to its immediate rival, Match.com.